be together. Do turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1. And uh, I haven't got a church Bible up here, so if somebody wants to shout out the page number, that would be helpful. I'm echoing a bit, I don't know why, but is that because I've got two microphones or... But never mind, we'll leave people to sort that out. If you want me to switch the Roe v. mic off, I'm just use the main one. No, we're all right, we're all right, good. Ephesians chapter one, brilliant. Page number, anybody? 1173. Ephesians chapter one, page 1173. Well, whole life worship. What sort of week have you had? Worshipping God with the whole of your lives. I think Holly mentioned last week about every time you have a drink, worshipping God. I think I forgot that one pretty quickly, but um, it might have happened over one drink. But um, have you got on worshipping the God with the whole of your lives? We saw last week that worship is responding to everything, responding with everything we have and are to what God has done for us. This quote from one commentator, worship in the New Testament means responding with uh, one's whole life and being to the divine kingship of Jesus. Worship in the New Testament means responding with one's whole life and being to the divine kingship of Jesus. But what does that look like? How do we, how do, we do that? So tomorrow morning, you're standing next to the bed of a woman who's screaming in pain as she tries to give birth to her first child, and you're meant to be worshipping God as you do it. Sounds a bit strange, doesn't it? Or you're a teacher, first lesson on Monday morning, kids all, um, you know, not really willing to to engage with you and listen to what's going on, and uh, you've got to teach the first lesson, and you've had a rubbishy weekend. How do you worship God? Or you're back in at Rolls-Royce tomorrow designing aeroplane blades. And you've heard on Sunday that you've got to worship God with the whole of your life. What does that look like? Or you're a young Christian going to school tomorrow morning. And you've heard me say on the Sunday morning, you know, that worship is responding with all of our lives to what God has done for us, the divine being of Jesus. How do you do that practically? What does that look like? Or maybe you're a parent struggling with looking after your kids and and, uh, you're just so glad when they've gone to school or when they're in bed and it all seems a bit of a struggle at the moment. How do you do that in an attitude that worships God? And what if you're retired and you get up every day and it's just the same and you've got nothing particularly to look forward to? How do you do that, worshipping God? Or what about in your marriage? Whether your marriage is great and you're on top of the world and so fully in love with your wife that it's so romantic and wonderful, you have a great time every day, or whether you're struggling and finding things a bit hard and dry sometimes. How do you do that and worship God? What if you've got a long-term illness and every day you get up and it's a struggle to get through another day? How do you do that, worshipping God? Or maybe you're a carer and you're looking after somebody full-time and every day you've got to get up and just look after this person and their needs. And somehow it feels like such drudgery at times. How do you do that? Worshipping God. And how do you do sermon notes on a Saturday afternoon when you'd rather be watching football or something, you know? And how how do you do that? Worshipping God and so on and so on. How do you do any of these things? As a response to the divine being of Jesus. How do you do that? Well, it seems to me that what we need is a vision that covers them all, a whole life vision. You could say that whole life worship will only flow out of a whole life vision, a total vision, a complete vision, an overarching vision that touches every area of our lives in such a way that it makes it purposeful so that everything we do contributes to this overall purpose, everything. From the moment we wake up in the morning to the time we go to bed at night, everything we do contributes to this whole life purpose, this whole life vision. But then you might be one of these really sort of pessimistic people and say, how can anything I do be purposeful if ultimately in a few short years I'm going 
to die. This is what Leo Tolstoy said when he reflected on that, the writer of War and Peace. Is there any meaning in my life which will not be annihilated by the inevitability of the death that awaits me? Any meaning in life which will not be annihilated by my death. So we need a vision as well that not just encompasses the whole of life, but a vision that encompasses beyond death, that encompasses everything that's in a sense universal. And so verse 15, for this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and the love which you have to all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation to know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Let's pray. Glorious Father, please give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that we may know you better. Amen. Paul is, is pleased to hear about the fact that these Ephesians are, are growing in their faith and he's thankful. But he's not just thankful for the fact that their faith is growing and they're loving people doing the basic things that Christians do, but he's, he's praying for them as well. And he's praying that through the power of the Holy Spirit, they might know God better. That's verse 17. So that you may know him better. You see, when you become a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ, you're introduced into a relationship, a living relationship with the living Lord Jesus. You know God. Jesus said, this is eternal life, that you might know God. And Jesus Christ, whom he has said, this is eternal life, knowing God, having a relationship with God. But that relationship needs to grow. It needs to deepen. It needs to get better. I, I'm really thankful to God that this year we'll be celebrating 40 years of marriage. I know I don't look old enough to have been married 40 years, but, um, but we still even after 40 years, are getting to know each other better. I had a young Christian uh, contact me this week, and he said he's just started reading Jim Packer's famous book, don't worry if you've never heard of it, but called Knowing God. And he suddenly realised as a young Christian that he knows a lot about God, but he's not sure that he really knows God in an experiential way. This isn't just information, this just isn't knowledge. But as Paul says, I pray that the eyes of your heart, in verse 18, the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. Do you realise you've got two pairs of eyes? You've got a, a pair of eyes that sees physically, but you've got a pair of eyes that sees spiritually. That the eyes of your heart, that's the whole being, your whole person, might come to know God better. So let me ask you a question. In your knowledge of God at the moment, what do you see? What do you experience? What do you feel? What do you long for? This is a dynamic relationship. I, I try to use this illustration. I mean, exercise. We're, we all know, don't we? We've all been told so many times that, you know, at least three times a week for half an hour, you've got to 
pump it so your blood, your heart rate goes up as far as it possibly can, three times a week, half an hour at least. Hands up if you know that. Hands up if you do it. Very, very few. You see, it's no good just knowing something. It's no good just knowing about God. You've got to believe it to be true, and then it changes your desires. It's so important, it's so vital, that it changes the way you desire things. It changes your emotions, and then you change your behavior. You get off your backside and you run, or you do whatever you do to exercise or swim and so on. Do you see this? Paul is praying that the eyes of their hearts may be enlightened. And I can speak this morning till I'm blue in the face, but unless we pray that God gives us, gives you a spirit of wisdom and revelation to know him better, it will all be in vain. But that's the sort of knowledge that Paul is praying for, that our hearts may be enlightened. And he prays for three things. This is his whole life vision. First of all, in verse 18, he prays that you may know the hope to which he has called you. Listen carefully. He wants you to know, God wants you to know the hope to which you've been called. Now, this call is not vague. This is not, Steve, do you feel like coming around after church and having a coffee? It's a call that is a summons. It's not a casual invitation. It's a command. The theologians call it an effectual call. In other words, it always works. It never fails. I want you. That's what Jesus is saying. That's the call of God. I want you. I want you to belong to me. I want you to be part of my family. And so when Paul writes to the Romans, he talks to them about the call of Jesus Christ. God has called you into fellowship with his son. Have you got hold of that? God, the living God, has deliberately intervened in your life to call you to belong to him. But he wants us to know the hope of that call. And it's for what? What is the hope of that call? It's for glory. It's for everlasting friendship and fellowship and relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why he prays to the one who is the glorious father, the father of glory, because he's calling us to this hope, which is glorious, which is glory. That is the hope to which you have been called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Past tense, you see? It's it's certain. It's the hope to which you've been called. We read in our prayer time this morning from the words of the Lord Jesus in his prayer, I want, he's praying to his father, I want those you've been given me, those you've given to me, all you believers, to be with me where I am. That's what he wants. So that you might behold his glory. That's the hope to which you've been called. Christ in you, the hope of glory. As we behold him, we're being changed all the way through our lives from one degree of glory to another. And when he actually appears, we shall be like him, for we will see him as he is. He who has this hope in him lives a different life, purifies himself. You see, this is a vision which goes beyond death. It's it's goal, it's end. It's the point of our salvation. That's where it's all heading. And it's the hope that gives meaning and purpose to everything that we do. You see, it's this vision that I was talking about, this whole life vision. So I'm struggling in my job tomorrow morning. It's hard going. But I know he's working through these circumstances to change me to one day become perfectly like him. He causes all things to work together for that good. He's predetermined that I will become like Jesus. That's the hope. I'm struggling in this relationship. This person I relate to at work or at school is hard, but he's using that. So Paul will say we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. But we also rejoice in our sufferings. Because suffering produces perseverance. 
and perseverance, character, and character, hope. There he goes again, you see. So whichever way you go, you end up with hope in the glory of God. And Paul says, you and I, if we're going to give the whole of our lives in worship to God, if everything's going to have a purposeful meaning, we need to pray that we see this hope clearly. You know that, that little video with all those things rushing at you, tape blinding your eyes, rushing, 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 rushing. Push them away and see the hope to which you've been called. And then the second thing that he asks, he prays for in verse 18, is that they will know the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. Now, that's remarkable. The riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. We're used to talking about as Christians about our inheritance, aren't we, you know? We've been born again to a living hope to the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is, will never perish, spoil or fade. Yeah, Easter sermon over and over and over again. Our inheritance. But here, just look at the words closely. He's praying that you may know the hope, the riches of his inheritance in us. God inherits in us his holy people. Have you got that? Do you begin to see that? God is going to inherit you and me, his holy people. It's not actually a new idea. God's people are described as his inheritance in the Old Testament as well. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. But this inheritance in us, he says, it's the riches of his glorious inheritance. It's, it's priceless. It's glorious. He describes us as his treasured possession. He, he's always wanted a people, hasn't he? He's always wanted a bride for himself. We see that in chapter 5 in Ephesians. So I get the hope of his calling. That's what I get. And he gets me, us, as his inheritance. Now, what happens if you know you're going to inherit something? What do you normally do? I mean, depends what it might be, but certainly, you know, if it's your mum's jewellery, you know that you're going to inherit that. Well, you might look at it occasionally, you might look after it, you might protect it, you might keep it clean, you might, because you know it's going to come to you eventually. In my family, it was my father's um, MBE medal, because he got an MBE for services to the community and so on, but... But we know all about it, and we treasure it, and we care for it, and we, we protect it, and we watch over it. Well, that's what Jesus is doing with his inheritance. He will see the fruit of his soul, and he will be satisfied with us. As we sang last uh, Sunday night, I think it was, millions redeemed shall be Jesus' reward. In chapter 5, the church is going to present her to himself, a glorious church. Isn't this wonderful? I, I get the hope to which he's called me, but he gets us as his inheritance. So you're making aero engines tomorrow morning. You're making blades to fit in aeroplanes that might not yet still be flying, and you think, is this really worth it or whatever? But hang about, I'm Jesus' inheritance. I want to do this the best way I possibly can because it's for him and he's going to inherit me. And I don't want him to inherit something that's been shabby or, 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 or dilapidated or uncommitted. I want him to, to have the best that he possibly can. I'll do it as the best as I can. What about when you wake up in the morning and you can't get out of bed because of your long-term illness? I'm Jesus' inheritance. We, we just sang about it, didn't we, in that, you know, uh, uh, hallelujah, sing to Jesus. There's one of the lines in there that just struck me and nearly brought me to tears. I was lost, but Jesus found me. Yeah? Found me. Made me his inheritance. He will lead me safely till the river rolls its water at my feet. Then he'll bear me safely over. All my joys in him complete. That's what will keep me going. I'm Jesus' inheritance. I'll persevere. He's preparing me. But we need to pray 
that we see clearly with the eyes of our hearts that that is what we're being prepared for. I get the hope, he gets the inheritance. But how do these two things come together? The, the hope to which he's called us, us as his inheritance. How do they come together? Everything seems against us, doesn't it? The flesh is against us every day when we wake up as well, isn't it? You know, with all its corrupt and, and deceitful desires. You know, I'm motivated by so many evil things at times, aren't you? Do you, do, you, do you experience that as well? You know, the first thing you think about when you wake up is something that's completely godless sometimes. We're motivated to do wrong things. We, and then it's not just the flesh, but the world in which we live where evil seems to reign. I mean, I don't need to explain any of that to you. The corruption, the lying, the greed, the warfare, the wicked leaders, a world against us. We've just been praying, Julie's been praying for that student movement in Belarus, where they're putting on a conference for 100 international students and they're asking us to pray that the KGB don't watch it and infiltrate it. We must pray that this week for them in Belarus. And then behind it all, there's Satan and his hosts waging war against the church. As Paul will say in chapter 6 of Ephesians, spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. These rulers, these powers, these authorities exercising dominion. How can I possibly survive? I've got this hope. I want to get there. I know I'm in his inheritance, but how can we bring those two things together? I feel so weak, so failing, so crummy sometimes as a Christian. Sometimes it's easier to stay away from God's people, to pack it all in and say never again. What hope? What inheritance? I was talking with somebody last night, just yesterday evening, who hasn't been near church for two years, so angry with so many different things. They've just walked away completely. Paul says, I want you to know the third thing. Verse 19, his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead. I want you to know this. Paul ransacks the dictionary for words about power. I don't know if you noticed that. Uh, um, his incomparably great power. Power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted. He uses six or seven different words to try and get across this thought to the church in Ephesus and to us today that this mighty power, which is for us, who believe. Do you see that in verse 19? It's for us who believe. The greatest power in the universe, not a physical power, was a spiritual power that took a man who was in the grave, dead and buried, and raised into life with a new body, and then took him up through the heavens, far above all principality, power, might, and dominion, and every name that can be named, not only in this age, but in the one to come, and has put all things in subjection under his feet and made him Lord of all. Did you notice the alls, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is named? And God placed all things under his feet and pointed him to be head over everything for the church. It's as if Paul just runs out of words completely to express this power which is for us who believe. You see, if you lived in Ephesus, well, your great power was the goddess Artemis, Diana. Two hours they stood there shouting when there was that riot. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. They would name other gods. Every time they wanted something, they would name a particular god. They practiced magic. They believed in the, the world was ruled by powers. And us? In our pathetic, superstitious way, we touch wood University challenge those brightest brains in the country. They've got little mascots on the desk in front of them. I just love to go and say, can I just take your mascot away? And would you be all right to be on University Challenge without your mascot? I bet they'd go be up in arms. Astrology, tarot cards, all sorts of stupid uh, superstitions. Stupid superstitions as well, yes. God has placed all things 
under his feet. And he's appointed him to be head over everything. For the church. <laughs> Jesus rules all things as a man for the sake of us, his church, to make sure that we get to the hope and to make sure that he gets his inheritance. Jesus Christ, the glorified man, now rules everything. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing tomorrow, all for our benefit. To make sure that we get the hope and he gets the inheritance. And the future is guaranteed. If you go on into chapter 2, there is no actual uh, connecting words at the end of chapter 1 and chapter 2 in the original. It just starts, and you, and you. The incomparably great power that raised Christ from the dead and set him in his own right hand, far above all principality and power, and you, which is why in verse 6 he says, raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ. We're untouchable. That's why the church is such a glorious church. That's why it's so great to be a Christian. So if you are struggling with old age this morning, you've got everything to look forward to. The best is yet to come for the whole church. So in this little piece of life that we've got on earth here, we're just waiting for the hope to which we've been called. We're waiting for him to inherit in us. And let's just invest everything that we've got in what we do for him as we look for that hope and he looks at that inheritance. It's a whole life vision that will make us do everything, in a sense, with an attitude of worship. Whole life worship happens, is real, when we have a whole life vision Hope, inheritance, power. If you want a hip vision, and it's easy to remember, the hope to which you've been called, get up tomorrow morning, the inheritance that he's going to have in us and the power which is on his church to rule all things for the sake of his glory and to bring his purposes to completion. That's what we're to know. That's what we're to see clearly with the eyes of our hearts being opened. But it's revelation that comes from the Spirit, from the Holy Spirit who lives in each one of us as we pray. So let's pray.